One of the most central features of what we could call the setting of Philip K. Dick's to Android's dream of electric sheep, besides things like the war having been fought and radioactive dust being everywhere and animals being rare, is this quasi-religion, we could call it, of mercerism. Partly religion, partly psychotherapy, partly philosophy, partly experience. And it's centered around this guy, Mercer, and the practice of using what's called an empathy box in order to attain a state of fusion. And this is something that divides human beings and androids. They not only can't participate in the fusion, they, they also kind of can't wrap their heads around what's going on in there, what human beings are getting out of it. And we first encounter the empathy box and Mercer in chapter two, um, and it's through the eyes and remembrances and we could say inner narration of John Isidore the special. He lives in a building all by himself and he's, you know, thinking I'm going to go off to work and then, you know, he comes back um, and he says, uh, time to grasp the handles, he said to himself and crossed the living room to the black empathy box. When he turned it on, the usual faint smell of negative ions surged from the power supply. He breathed in eagerly already buoyed up. He's, he's anticipating a good experience, right? Then the cathode ray tube glowed like an imitation feeble TV image. A collage formed made of apparently random colors, trails, and configurations, which until the handles were grasped amounted to nothing. So taking a deep breath to steady himself, he grasped the twin handles. This is the sort of entrance into it. You grab the two and now you're transported. The visual image congealed. He saw at once a famous landscape, the old brown barren ascent with tufts of dried out bone-like weeds poking slantedly into a dim and sunless sky. One single, human, one single figure, more or less human in form, toiled its way up the hillside. An elderly man wearing a dull featureless robe, covering as meager as if it had been snatched from the hostile emptiness of the sky. The man, William Mercer, plodded ahead, and as he grasped the handles, John Isidore gradually experienced a waning of the living room in which he stood, and he found himself instead, as always before, entering into the landscape of drab hill, drab sky, and at the same time he no longer witnessed the climb of the elderly man. His own feet now scraped, sought purchase among the familiar loose stones. He felt the same old painful irregular roughness beneath his feet and again smelled the acrid haze of the sky. Not earth sky, but that of some place alien, distant and yet by means of the empathy box, instantly available. So the empathy box puts you into, at worst, a virtual reality and perhaps something more, perhaps a connection with Mercer himself. It goes on, he had crossed over in the usual perplexing fashion, physical merging accompanied by mental and spiritual identification with Wilbur Mercer had reoccurred. So in using the empathy box, Mercer and the user are now sharing the same consciousness, the, the, the same memories or experiences, at least for a while. And it goes on further. He says, uh, as it did for everyone who at this moment clutched the handles, either here on Earth or on one of the colony planets, he experienced them, the others incorporated the babble of their thoughts, heard in his own brain the noise of their many individual existences. So let me talk about that for a moment. The, the others now are part of this experience as well. So it's not just Mercer and each individual user, it's the users in relation to each other with Mercer as being, you might say, the catalyst that allows all of these consciousnesses to precipitate out and to exist in relation to each other. And so he says, they and he cared about one thing, this fusion of their mentalities oriented their attention on the hill, the climb, the need to ascend. And so that is what centers them. And um, you know, then they are going to reach the top. 
And then another key component to this, a rock hurled at him, struck his arm. He felt the pain. He half turned and another rock sailed past him, missing him. It collided with the earth and the sound startled him. Who? He wondered, peering to see his tormentors, the old antagonists manifesting themselves at the periphery of his vision. It or they had followed him all the way up to the hill and would remain at the top. He remembered, or he's anticipating the top, the sudden leveling of the hill when the climb ceased and the other part began, which is going to be, in many respects, much worse. And everybody else is feeling the same thing. Then within him, the mutual babble of everyone else in fusion broke the illusion of aloneness. You felt it too, he thought. Yes, the voices answered. We got hit on the left arm. It hurts like hell. And so this is the opportunity to share consciousness and experiences and affectivity and thoughts with other people in this, this fusion. So this is a, a really central part of it. And you know, who are these antagonists? If we skip ahead a little bit to chapter three, where Rick Deckard, the bounty hunter, is now reflecting on things. You know, he, he talks about you know, empathy and, and what it's for. But um, here's the key part for Mercerism. The empathetic gift blurred the boundaries between hunter and victim, between successful and defeated. As in the fusion with Mercer, everyone ascended together, or when the cycle had come to an end, fell together into the trough of the tomb world. And he goes on and he says, as long as some creature experienced joy, the condition for all other creatures included a fragment of joy. If any living being suffered, then for all the rest, the shadow could not be entirely cast off, right? So this is an important part of it. And then Rick thinks about androids, and he says, in retiring, killing an Andy, he did not violate the rule of life laid down by Mercer. You shall kill only the killers. Now notice the importance of that. It's not saying you will not kill at all, right? Which would actually be feasible for many human beings within the society that uh, you know, Descartes and Isidore live in where animal life is incredibly, you know, sacred and respected. Um, and human life is generally not taken by other humans, right? Androids are left out of the equation as we see in the work and androids are conscious of being left out of the equation as well. You will kill only the killers, the antagonists in this fusion process, or in the case of Rick Deckard, killing androids, right? Mercer had told them the year that empathy boxes first appeared on earth and in Mercerism, as it evolved into a full theology, the concept of the killers had grown insidiously. In Mercerism, an absolute evil plucked at the threadbare cloak of the tottering ascending old man but it was never clear who or what <clears throat> this evil presence was. A Mercerite sensed evil without understanding it. Put another way, a Mercerite was free to locate the nebulous presence of the killers wherever he saw fit. For Rick Deckard, an escaped humanoid robot, which had killed its master, which had been equipped with an intelligence greater than that of many human beings, which had no regard for animals, which possessed no ability to feel empathetic joy for another's life form success or grief at its defeat, that for him epitomized the killer. So even though Deckard himself is not a you know, very keen follower of Mercerism, it does provide him with a framework in which Killing the killers, the androids, helps make sense out of his life. Now, going back to chapter uh, two with Isidore remembering these things and, and remembering it in fusion, we get to hear part of Mercer's story. And this is Mercer sort of revealing things to him. Once it had been different back before the curse had come, an earlier happier part of life, they, his foster parents, Frank and Cora Mercer, had found him floating on an inflated rubber air rescue raft off the coast of New England, or had it been Mexico. He did not now remember the circumstances. Childhood had been nice. He had loved all life, especially the animals. Had, in fact, been able for a while, for a time, to bring back dead animals as they had been. So this is really key about Mercer. He lived with rabbits and bugs wherever it was, either on Earth or a colony world. He'd forgotten that too. 
but he recalled the killers because they arrested him as a freak, more special than the other specials. And due to that, everything had changed. Now, again, this is what Mercer is giving all the people in fusion as they remember what he remembers. Local law prohibited the time reversal faculty by which the dead returned to life. They'd spelled it out to him during his 16th year. He continued for another year to do it secretly, but an old woman uh, had told. Without his parents' consent, they, the killers, had bombarded the unique nodule which had formed in his brain, had attacked it with radioactive cobalt, and this had plunged him into a different world one of whose existence he had never suspected. This is the tomb world. It had been a pit of corpses and dead bones, and he struggled for years to get up from it. The donkey, and especially the toad, the creatures most important to him, had vanished, had become extinct. Only rotting fragments, an eyeless head here, part of a hand there remained. At last, a bird which had come there to die told him where he was. He had sunk down into the tomb world. He could not get out until the bones strewn around him grew back into living creatures. He had become joined to the metabolism of other lives. And until they rose, he could not either. How long that part of the cycle had lasted, he did not now know. Nothing had happened, generally, so it had been measureless. Without anything happening, you can't tell time passing. But at last, the bones had regained flesh, the empty eye pits had filled up, and the new eyes had seen. While meanwhile, the restored beaks and mouths had cackled, barked, and caterwauled. Possibly he had done it. Perhaps the extrasensory note of his brain had finally grown back. Or maybe he hadn't accomplished it. Maybe it was a natural process. Anyhow, he was no longer sinking. He'd begun to ascend along with the others. Long ago, he'd lost sight of them. He found himself evidently climbing alone, but they were there. They still accompanied him. He felt them strangely inside him. So Mercer becomes something like a resurrected, um, you know, what would we call him? catalyst, uh, messiah in some respects, uh, a bringer of life, protector of life, coming up from the tomb world, coming up from the realm of death and decay. And this is going to be another central idea as well that pops up. Um, you know, Descartes himself acknowledges that there's, you know, all, all of this stuff going on and, and Mercer is at the center of Isidore in explaining um, Mercerism, uh, also notes that, as he talks about Kipple, the only real exception to this is, is Mercer. But he also explains Mercerism to an android. And the androids don't really like Mercerism. In part, they're resentful of it, right? So when Pris first shows up, um, he says, um, here we go, no one can win against Kipple. Um, it's a universal principle. The entire universe is moving, moving towards a final state of total, almost kippleization, except, of course, for the upward climb of Wilbur Mercer, which human beings can participate in. The girl item, I don't see any relation. That's what Mercerism is all about. Again, he found himself puzzled. Don't you participate in fusion? Don't you own an empathy box? After a pause, the girl said carefully, I didn't bring mine with me. I assume I'd find one here. But an empathy box, he said, stammering it as an excitement, is the most personal possession you have. It's an extension of your body. It's the way you touch other humans. It's the way you stop being alone. But you, you know that. Everyone knows that. Mercer even lets people like me. He broke off, but too late. He had already told her, and he, and he could see by her face the flicker of sudden aversion that she knew. I almost passed the IQ test, but I'm not very special, only moderately. Not like some you see, but that's what, that's what Mercer doesn't care about. And then Pris has a great one-liner. As far as I'm concerned, you can count that as a major objection to Mercerism. So again, we see the contrast between the human and the android here. Now, there's a, a very important set of passages that we find taking place in chapter 15 after Rick brings home the uh, goat who he has bought with the bounties on the three retri re retired androids. And Erin, you know, and Rick talk back and forth and, you know, they're very happy. And then she says, 
Really, we ought to go downstairs. She says, "Let's run downstairs and give thanks to Mercer. Then we can come right up here and name her. She needs a name. Maybe you can find some rope to tether her. And why why is this important? Because it would be immoral not to fuse." With Mercer in gratitude, she says, "I had a hold of the handles of the box today, and it overcame my depression a little, just a little, not like this." And then she shows him a bruise where she had gotten hit by a rock, and she says, "Get in, Rick. This will just be for a minute. You hardly ever undergo fusion." And then here's where it comes in with another interesting thing. It's not just immoral not to fuse with Mercer in gratitude. Why is it immoral not to fuse with it? She talks. She brings up the word immoral again. It would be immoral to keep their joyful mood to oneself. As you're、uh, a user using the empathy box, fusing with Mercer, you can transmit to others what it is that you're feeling, and you can thereby be supportive and in solidarity with them. She says, "I want you to transmit the mood you're in now to everyone else. You owe it to them. It would be immoral to keep it for ourselves." So they they go to, go do that, and she goes on. She says, "I want everyone to know. Once that happened to me, I fused and picked up someone who had just acquired an animal, and then one day, one day, I found myself receiving from someone whose animal had died. But others shared our different joys with them. I didn't have any, as you might know, and that cheered the person up. We might even reach a potential suicide. What we have, what we're feeling, might. And now Rick says something interesting that shows his perspective." Being very different from from hers, he's got kind of a zero sum mentality about this. He says they'll have our joy, but we'll lose. We'll exchange what we feel for what they feel. Our joy will be lost. And then Erin says, "We won't really lose what we feel, not if we keep it clearly in mind." You've never really gotten the hang of fusion, have you, Rick? So there's two different ways of looking at it. I I share in this. And if I'm bringing good stuff to it, well, that's good for everybody else, but it kind of sucks for me because it's literally sucking my joy out, right? And Erin is saying, no, 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 you just hold on to your joy and let it diffuse to other people through their consciousness. This is another possibility, and it's you know two different interesting models here. Now remember that Rick had talked about this earlier. Empathy itself is. Sharing the joy of others, also sharing the suffering of others, right? So they go on, and、um, Rick actually has his first fateful encounter with Mercer. He、um, here we go As, at the Black Empathy Box. His wife crouched, her face wrapped. He stood beside her for a while, his hand resting on her breast. He let it rise and fall. The life in her, in the activity. Erin did not notice him. The experience with Mercer had, as always, become complete. On the screen, the faint old robed figure of Mercer toiled upward. A rock sailed past him. Watching, Rick thought, "My God, there is something worse about my situation than his." Mercer doesn't have to do anything alien to him. He suffers, but at least he isn't required to violate his own identity. And then he takes his wife's fingers off the handles and takes her place. For the first time in weeks, an impulse that he hadn't planned it at all, all at once it happened. And here we go. A landscape of weeds, weeds confronted him—a desolation. The air smelled of harsh blossoms. This was the desert. There was no rain. A man stood before him—a sourful light in his weary, pain-drenched eyes. Mercer, Rick said. I am your friend, the old man said. But you must go on as if I did not exist. Can you understand that? No, Rick said. I can't understand that. I need help. How can I save you? The old man said. If I can't save myself, don't you see, there is no salvation. Then what's this for? Rick demanded. What are you for? To show you, Wilbur Mercer said, that you aren't alone. I am here with you and always will be. Go and do your task, even though you know it is wrong. Why? Rick said. Why should I do it? I'll quit my job and emigrate. The old man said. And here's where we get, you know, one of the key passages of the book. 
You will be required to do wrong no matter where you go. It is the basic condition of life to be required to violate your own identity. At some time, every creature which lives must do so. It is the ultimate shadow, the defeat of creation. This is the curse at work, the curse that feeds on all life everywhere in the universe. That's all you can tell me, Rick said. A rock whizzed past me, ducked in the rock, struck him on the ear. At once he let go of the handles and he stood in his own living room beside his wife in the empathy box. And he tells her, um, I didn't get anything from holding on to these handles. Mercer talked to me, but it didn't help. He doesn't know any more than I do. He's just an old man climbing a hill to his death. And she says, isn't that the revelation? And he says, well, I have that revelation already. So it seems kind of inconclusive, right? Mercer has this experience to offer people that, you know, Irian and Isidore and other people like them get a lot out of. Deckard, he actually has this sort of privileged encounter with Mercer, talking to him one-on-one, and he's not getting from Mercer what he needs, other than this assurance that, He's not unique in having to, as he says, do things that violate his own identity. So we see that Mercer plays an incredibly important role within the narrative world of this novel and for the characters who populate it. 